I can't yet see it, so but it uh, as soon as I see it, I'll let you know. It's telling me it's late streaming live now. Okay. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to this special lecture in the research methods course at the CSSC. We are pleased to be able to make some of our lectures available via the online webinar and live stream formats to a wider audience along with our regular students. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Aniket Alam who will speak to us about how computational technology and tools have influenced and opened up possibilities for social science research today. Dr. Alam is Associate Professor of History at the Indian Institute of Information Technology at Hyderabad, and particularly well-placed to speak to us about this topic, as he has been involved for some years now in running a dual degree program in computer sciences and human sciences. His primary research area is the history of colonialism in the Western Himalayas, and he is also interested in the transformation of family forms and in left politics. His first book, Becoming India, Western Himalayas Under British Rule, was published by Cambridge in 2008. He has a particular interest in historical methods and has integrated Annals, Marxist, structuralist anthropological methods, and more recently, computational tools to make sense of the Western Himalayas. Dr. Alam was a journalist with the Hindu, and for many years, the executive editor of the EPW. He's currently working on the social history of Spiti in Himachal Pradesh, and a broader history of the Himalayas and contiguous Asian highlands over the past few centuries, using computational tools like spatial informatics, natural language processing, big data analytics, and social network analysis. Aniket, over to you. Thank you, Prachi. Uh... It sounds uh, it sounds sounds uh, more fancy than it actually is. Um, yeah, just trying to make sense of the world we live in. Um, I've been a historian of the Himalayas, as Prachi said, and this is something new. I mean, uh, when I started my work in uh, as a historian, um, and me and Prachi were contemporaries in the same department in JNU. Uh, this thing of computers wasn't at all on the horizon. That was not something we were thinking about. Um, but over the last uh, three decades, two and a half, three decades, um, it has become impossible to escape that. And uh, particularly the last five years that I have been involved in IIIT here, uh, the International Institute of Information Technology in Hyderabad, um, as part of their human sciences center, but uh, trying to build up and now run a dual degree program where students join for a BTEC in computer science, and then a second degree, which is called a master's, it's a master of science in the human sciences, uh, where they're expected to use computational tools to work on humanity, social science issues. Um, so this, this has been a real learning experience. And uh, I have been wary of speaking about this because it has been a struggle to understand what computers are. Uh, it has been uh, both for the technical issues. Um, you know, Typically, people who get into the humanities, social sciences are not the strongest in their maths and uh, sciences uh, disciplines, but also some sort of... Uh, uh, a psychological, uh, conceptual um, block, you know, to understand, to access it, to try and look at it, uh, I won't use the word objectively, but uh, without the obvious prejudices, which hold back people on both sides, uh, uh, humanists, humanists and uh, social scientists typically have uh, stereotypical uh, views of what computer science does. Uh, what machines do, and uh, engineers, computer scientists typically have uh, reductive views of what these social sciences and humanities do. Um, it has been five years uh, of uh, struggle, but also of understanding a completely different new terrain, of realizing that people all over the world are actually uh, doing really, really interesting things. Uh, 
and not just in disciplines like um, say economics or sociology or um, politics um, where you would think that quantitative data analysis is uh, you know is far more amenable to being used but in things like archaeology in things like cultural studies literature there's a huge amount of work being done on using computational tools for literature on history um, so it's an exciting new thing people are struggling to make sense of it people are trying to find out new tools uh, typically the tools available are not uh, designed for social science work so one has to work on them try to make them fit as best as it can and i have been it's it's been a happy struggle it's been something which uh, i have uh, enjoyed doing over the last 5 years and it is only in the last uh, couple of months that i feel confident of speaking about this uh, publicly outside of my students who basically can't escape when i speak for that one hour with them <laughs> so but other than that uh, this is the first time i'm actually uh, talking about this uh, in public uh, talking to people outside my institution i did a similar talk in the law university in hyderabad nalsar some time back so what i'll do is uh, i'll talk about the broader issues but uh, i'm also going to spend uh, some time uh, hopefully i'll manage my time well uh, i'll try and spend some time at least uh, showing you some of the work uh, that students here have done under my supervision uh, the type of research that a confluence of computer science and social sciences humanities is allowing us to do and these are uh, master students so basically they do work like an mphil i mean you know to put it simply um they this is not phd and i assume that most people here who are uh, attending uh, would be phd scholars right um but uh, let's see let me start my presentation and uh on just a second and then take you through yeah so you can see my presentation right you can see the screen um yes sir yeah great great all right so um just let me set this thing up a little bit so that i can uh, excellent so yeah the thing is what have computers done to the social sciences and uh, in a sense you know you could say it's just a question of it's a difference of degree uh there has been uh, no major change as such um it's basically measurement and quantification at its core and that is something which uh, all social sciences humanities at some level have i mean it is the um measuring out the quantification of space of material objects of nature of people but also things like time um uh, quantification of time of being able to break it down to smaller and smaller uh, elements which can be brought together and taken apart uh, ideas values uh, quantifying those these have been basically foundational to the emergence of the social sciences and humanities even if and even when uh, there have been critiques of these um, of unreflexive quantification of um, sort of you know the just putting together of massive amounts of data or facts and questioning of facts and data yet at the core uh, modern social sciences is distinguished by the fact that we can measure we can quantify um, which allows us to analyze in a certain way breaking up its constituent elements it allows us to find patterns it allows us to find trends processes build narratives around that uh, this is what opens up uh, knowledge 
to in in the modern mode, you know, of uh, and particularly in the 18th and 19th century, it came into its own. In the 20th century, there had been a fair number of critics. I won't, of course, go into those here, but just to flag the fact that, despite that, in some ways, measurement and quantification remain central to the understanding of uh, these, you know, the, the world in which we live. Um, just a second, I can't see my, um, maybe I should. Um, yeah, I think that's better. Sorry, yeah, so my display was all over the place. Right, so in a sense, this is old wine and what do computers do? They just put it in new bottles because they raise our powers of measurement and quantification. We know that, right? I mean, this is a trivial point in some ways. They raise it exponentially in a way where breaking down of things that we are studying into their constitutive elements, adding them up in different ways, the speed increases, the amount we can do increases. And most important of all, uh, there is nothing which is a representation which cannot be broken and turned into numbers. At the core of it, what basically has happened is that everything, I mean, the words I'm saying here, this, the, this oral sound, right, and a, a lot of say, for example, uh, our theories work on uh, the link between uh, the oral sound and the meaning, for example, but that basically is reaching you and whatever else is happening through numbers. So it gets broken into zeros and ones, the binary, right? And it's not the binary of Claude Levi-Strauss, it's the binary of the computers, where it's all broken up to zero and one, and then reconfigured at the machine you are at. So whether it's the text you are reading on the screen, whether it's the speech, if you are seeing the visuals, everything can be turned into numbers, stored, transported, sent to YouTube, reconfigured. You know, all of these things is basically numbers. And when you start breaking everything into numbers, there's a huge number of numbers. Right? The, the quantification of numbers, I mean, it's just the thing becomes really big. And that's where big data starts, right? What, what is called, because big data is not just huge amounts of data. I mean, of course there is, it is huge amounts of data, but the definitional aspect of big data is that big data is something which is beyond human capabilities. Even if you have 200 people working for 20 years, they will still be unable to deal with that data. That, the ability to do that, the ability to deal with numbers, quantifications, measurements, which are well beyond the ability of humans to do, even with tools, even with, say, small, um, um, measuring devices, manual measuring devices, non-computational. It, it, it is still beyond that. And that is what computers have done. And the burden of uh, my talk today is to try and tell you that this has actually changed what we do as the social science, in the social sciences in the humanities. And Unfortunately, I mean, speaking only for myself, maybe there are others who didn't do that, but I think it's a shared problem for a lot of us. We haven't given it enough thought. So when the printing press came, I suppose, I don't know how much thought was given. Of course, people did realize something had changed. When electricity came, people realized something had changed. But we have given a fair amount of thought today to what happened at that time. We, I think, are living through something similar the changes are equally drastic and foundational, but we have not invested. And when I say we, I'm talking of the larger community of social scientists, humanities, uh, scholars, 
who have not really invested that much of time and effort to understanding what it has done to our disciplines and also to the world. Right? It is happening. It's not as if it has not happened. It is happening, but uh, far less than what is necessary. It is still not generalized. Uh, it is still a niche thing where people do digital humanities or people study the impact of computers on human beings and the, what is called human computer interaction and things like that. It's not generalized. And I think uh, there is a, a, a crying need to do that, I mean, to look at it as something which impacts anything and everything that we do. And the points of impact, I mean, you know, there's of course the everyday use of emails, websites, web processing, you know, basic number crunching, whether you are using a calculator or whether you are using an uh, Excel sheet just for, you know, keeping your marks or just looking at uh, data of um, whatever, you know, basic things. Uh, there is that. And if you actually sit down and list all that is happening, the impact, how has it changed the access to archives, even paper archives, even, you know, uh, material remains which are not digitizing. Uh, it's changed the way you do. For example, I don't think anybody does what we did, perhaps me and Prachi, when we went to the archives first is to carry a pencil and lots of paper and write everything with a pencil because pens were not allowed. Today, I see almost everywhere, whether it's the National Archives or, you know, in, in, in Delhi or in Shimla when I go or anywhere else in London, people are just sitting with their smartphones and taking uh, pictures of those documents, mostly, right? Um, sharing them, putting them into your Google Drive, which is basically a cloud, which is basically a function of all these things, big data. So you're creating huge amounts of data, you're storing those, and you have to then retrieve those at in real time, practically, uh, in real time as for humans, you know, instantaneously in the sense for humans, you have to do that, you have to create, store, retrieve it constantly, so much so that you don't even think about it. You It goes beyond your thought. I mean, it just happens. It's like, you know, the air there, it's uh, unreflexive. And then the other big thing, the point of impact, where computers are making a big difference is the network analysis. And that is not something which started with computers, but uh, computer analysis, uh, a large part of it is that, a large part of what we say, you know, all these people are gathering our data, whether it's Google or Amazon and all that, what they do is a large part of what they're doing to understand consumer behavior, to what citizens are doing, to prevent crime as it is, or anything else is basically network analysis. Look at the connections, the centralities, the trends, interpret them. And a lot of this is dependent on what is called natural language processing. So you look at meanings, uh, there are various tools, computational tools, there are various methods of, you know, how do you look at a text? How do you parse a text? Um, basic start from basic grammar, but then you get various tools into it, this sentiment analysis, there's polarization, there's various other things. Look at the ontologies, which is very important. Some of, one of the things which I remember, the first things I remembered is that when I came to a computer science institute as a pure humanist um, historian, everybody was talking about ontologies because it's so important. How do you define it? So if the computer, how does the computer know that this is a table and this is not a bed, right? Uh, so the definition has to be really rigorous. And translations, it's not just between say Telugu and Bengali or between Mandarin and Swahili. Uh, the translations between one program to the other, the translations from one platform to the other, the translations from one context to the other, it should still make sense. Uh, those are really important and there's a, huge amount of work that has happened, uh, techniques which have come up, tools which have come up, and people are using them. And finally, the question of mapping. So there's, of, of course, some of the mapping which happens in the network analysis, but you know, it's also uh, the territories, the just um, before this talk started, I was talking to Shobik here 
about mapping. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody here has used or users or um, uh, has taken help of people who use Google Maps or some other sort of maps, but it's not just Google Maps, it's every other form in which mapping works in the background to provide results, to analyze, to interpret, to change how we sort of work. And basically what this does is that it creates a new, I mean, just using this fancy word, event horizon, but it, it does that, right? They create conditions where human observability, cognition, comprehension cease to operate outside of the machine. So what you see, what you can understand, what you can analyze is not what we have been able to do with the finest of theories, with the maximum number of research assistants or collaborators, with the greatest of funding, it's well beyond that. It creates what computer scientists call a black box. So there's a lot of inputs going in and an output which comes out and we really don't know how it works. So for human beings, we call it intuition. I had an intuition you're going to come to office today. I really, if you ask me why I thought you're going to come to office today, I will not perhaps be able to break it down. Oh, well, you know, I had a, I had a sixth sense. It's that, it's you cannot really give a reason. And that's increasingly what is happening with computers. Now, if what we do, our ability to observe, our ability to cognate, our ability to comprehend, our ability to analyze is now part of the machine, it's not outside it, even if you are not reflexive about it, what happens when this works through, not intuition, but a AI black box? And these are things we need to think about. What, so before I get into that black box, let me just, you know, there's all these, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Black Mirror and various other things. You have read Rise of the Robos or uh, Homo Deus or you know, what are all these uh, things that go around. Um, or at least, you know, seen uh, what's uh, the social dilemma or whatever. I mean, AI and ML uh, um, and it's sort of, um, in a sense, the shift of the millenniums, because in the previous millennium, M ML, particularly if I was sitting in CSSC and giving a talk in the previous millennium, it would mean completely different from what it means today, right? Um, but what exactly is AI ML? There's a lot of things. So it's basically, as I had already talked about, turn the world around us into numbers. Everything is a number. And then you have rules and protocols for creating, storing, retrieving, and analyzing this data. So it's just basically, so if there is a, if there are numbers, you say, okay, if this is so, then that will be what it is. And in this condition, X, in that condition, Y, in that Z, you just make rules, right? Uh, if the door is open, you walk out. If the door is closed, pull, the door open. I mean, basic rules, right? Now, these rules that you put on the data that you collect uh, often make mistakes because as computer scientists will constantly remind you, computers are dumb. They don't know what to do. You have to constantly tell them what to do. So you make rules, right? And because you're dealing with numbers, they're typically mathematical those rules, in, at least in their expressions, they're basically logical, you know, basic logic, but raised uh, to the power of N because of so many years of work, those rules are complex and those rules then need to be trained. So you tell uh, people that, okay, I have got this novel, I have um, scanned, 
and turned into machine readable text, which is called, you know, it could be any form of machine readable text. And now I'm going to look at what, what is in it. I'm going to analyze it, right? So there are these rules. So if you see this, then look for that, try and see how many times this happens or whatever rules you give them, and it'll come up with results and you say, no, no, this is not working and that is not working and you keep annotating it. So this is right, this is wrong, this is right. You're training the data. And soon enough, those rules start changing because they'll see, oh, okay, here I made a mistake, there I didn't, here I made a mistake, there I didn't. So they keep getting better. And as it works, of course, these simple rules give way to complex ones. And here I'm trying to give an explanation which uh, I suppose uh, no computer scientist would give. I'm trying to give it in terms of what would be comprehensible to uh, social scientists and humanists who do not have an understanding of computer science. So you are giving these simple rules of what should happen. If you look at this, then this. If not this, then that. And then, of course, these are becoming increasingly complex. There are layers and layers and layers. And the speed is becoming greater and greater. So instead of looking at, uh, I mean, if, if I'm looking at, say, pages of data, so I'll say, instead of looking at 10 pages of data at one time, you're looking at 100 pages. Maybe you're looking at 1,000 pages. At the same time, following all these rules, and the rules have hundreds of ex, you know, um, exceptions to them. Uh, various conditions to them. If in this condition, then that, and in some other condition, then something else. All those rules are there. And it is constantly being trained because humans keep annotating the data, keep telling them, no, this is right, this is wrong. So for example, you go on Google Maps and you know you say, I want to go to uh, CSSC and it points me to some place which is three buildings away. And Google asks me, is this right or wrong? And I say, no, it's wrong. And it says, can you point me to the right one? And I point it to it. That is basically human annotation of data. I have trained that AI. And it has machine learned through human interaction. And this creates basically what they call a neural network. It's called a neural network because there's a huge amount of actor network theory at work, social network analysis the networks of data, of rules, of protocols, how you're going to access what data, through which rules, and how is it going to show it to you, to you? Because it's not going to show to you as zero and ones. It's going to show to you in either text form or visual form or oral form, how it's going to come, what are the protocols for that? These are there, and it's basically, uh, 70 years of human effort at a global level, which has raised complexity to an extent where a lot of things what are happening, we still don't know because the rules are now learning themselves. So what is happening with this? It's self-learning. We'll talk about AlphaGo Zero a uh, little later. Right? Uh, there's this famous move 37. And right now, we are still perhaps not there, but there's this whole idea of generalized AI where AI is learning from AI. So now you, for example, have software which writes software. So you tell this software that I want a certain type of software written, it will produce that software for you. Um, you have you, you don't need to sort of sit and code. For example, when you write your thesis chapters, you just open it and work. It's you know it's constantly thinking. It's telling you what to do. It's suggesting things, right? The problem is uh, at this moment when self learning starts, when these rules start training themselves and learning from each other. Because of so many years that humans have been training them that we don't really know what that bot is doing, what that machine is doing. Why is it doing this? They're achieving uh, something like common sense. They're telling you how to go. So you're, you have gone from point A to point, you've gone from your home to CSSC every day using something else. And if you are the first time user of Google Maps, it will tell you, no, no, don't do that. Do something else. Yes. Now, the question is, 
Are machines achieving common sense? Are they changing common sense? What exactly is common sense? What exactly is intuition? Right? These are questions which are now very much open again. I mean, if ever they were closed, but they're open again in a very radical sense. Right? What is this common sense? And as uh, students of the social sciences, humanities, we know common sense is something full of bias. Right? Bias in the negative pejorative sense, but not, bias also as perspective, bias also as uh, subject position, right? The problem now, no, you know, in the social sciences and humanities, we have spent a lot of time and energy uh, trying to make a sense of what this bias is. What does it mean to say a certain framework, a certain methodology? What does it do? What does it not do? How does it do? Um, why am I taking a certain position? What is my subject position? How do I look at the world? Right? All of these things we have spent a lot of time on. The problem now that comes up is that the new common sense that is emerging through this computers is something where we do not really know what the bias is and where it resides. Where exactly does it reside? How much of our subject position becomes a pejorative bias? How much of our pejorative bias becomes our subject position? And where does it happen? How does it happen? And there are things, you know, when I'm talking about bias, I mean, there's certain things like I've listed here, facial recognition. There was this famous slash infamous case where um, they were training um, a computer software to recognize faces. Now, this is quite mundane. I mean, I open this computer, I open my phone, it looks at my face and it opens it. If it, my face changes, it doesn't open it. And it's becoming increasingly better. And this is almost 10 years ago um, when um, there was basically, they, they, they used, um, I think, uh, photographs from a dating site to uh, to look at faces and trying to see can the computer recognize faces and can the computer, you know, so can the computer look at a face and say, oh, this is a man and this is a woman. Um, this was before computers could be accused of being TERFs, um, but um, they ended up recognizing gay men. So because people had given their, you know, their markers as uh, gay or not, or something along the, uh, the spectrum, uh, it learned how to recognize gay men. So if you look at a photo and say this man, and you just give random photos after that, it trained itself so well that you look at random photographs and say, this man is gay and this man is not gay. And of course it was making errors, but its level of, I mean, the number of correct replies were far higher than any human being. And of course, we know what that does in our society. It leads to the most toxic forms of discrimination possible. Recently, very, very recently, as I mean, in this month, in August, I was reading tweets from uh, some research scholars who found that they were trying to look at x-rays to try and see if you know, software can identify diseases before the human eyes can. So if you look at a software, uh, if you look at an X-ray, you turn that X-ray into digits, right? Zeros and ones. And then the software is trained to say, okay, can I understand if this person is going to get cancer or, you know, something else? But what they ended up realizing was that software can actually identify race and they blurred out the X-rays to make it look just shades of white and gray. And still the software was able to identify the race almost to every person. I mean, even the best doctor wouldn't be able to perhaps see the X-ray, a chest X-ray and say what the race of the person is. Now this is what was happening, right? The outcomes work. The results are coherent. We do not know how these decisions are taken. There's a similar problem in maths, for example, which does not lead to um, toxic 
outcomes socially, politically. So for example, there was this famous case about uh, three or four years ago of uh, a maths equation which has not been solved for the last few centuries and uh, the computer solved it. But people really don't know whether it solved it because you know what does a maths equation being solved means that it could run into 200 pages but I should be able to follow those 200 pages step by step by step by step and say, yes, all your steps are right. All your steps are legitimate. They follow the logic of mathematics. And at the end, you have reached a solution. But here, I can't do that because I don't know what's gone in. I know what's gone in, but I don't know how that decision has been taken. Because by now, it's so complex. Those rules are so complex. Nobody knows how it does and what it does. And this is one of the big methodological conundrums that we are facing. If you do not know how a decision was taken, how do we verify it? How do we corroborate it? How do we falsify it? How do we engage with it? What happens to the idea of paradigms? I mean, even more, what happens to the idea of inductive and deductive distinctions? Because now what is happening is if you're working on sufficiently large data sets and inevitably they're all there, bots can make qualitative decisions. Bots means ML, you know, machines. And the definition of machine has changed. Machine is not a physical thing anymore. The machine is basically the software. So the machine can make qualitative decisions far beyond the ability of present day theories that we have. The best intuition that we have. And which is why it is such a big deal. During the Obama presidency, Michael Hayden actually said it in the most banal way that you know, uh, intelligence operatives uh, can do. Um, we kill people based on metadata. And he said, I mean, he, he said this uh, in response to a question whether they actually hack emails and messages to read what people are sending. He says, no, we don't do that because there's too much of data noise. If we hack emails, there's just too much. Metadata is enough. Sufficient metadata. What is metadata? It's the context, right? the time, the place, the platform, the language, the device, who's speaking to whom, where is it going from, at what speed, et cetera, et cetera. It's clues which allow you to build a story. It's typically what archeologists do, historians do, right? Detectives do, Sherlock Holmes, Heluda. So you look at a half burnt stub of a cigarette, some mud on a shoe, um, you know, a, what scent that person has put, uh, you know, a chipped nail, and you link all of these into a coherent narrative of what happened. And now we have so much of data that the CIA says we kill people based on metadata. And when he was asked for the success rate, he said it's about 50%. And people say, oh my God, that means 50% of them are innocent. And continuing in his uh, banal tone, he said, yeah, that's true, but that's the same as human intelligence. But we don't put our operatives at risk, putting them, putting feet on the ground. And he was, of course, talking of uh, the great success of uh, US foreign policy, which we are living through right now, Afghanistan and uh, Pashtun, uh, where they were sending drones and they were targeting people based on metadata. And he said, we don't, like, it's not that we don't have the technology. We can, of course, break into emails and text messages. We don't want to do that. It's just too much of data. We can't deal with it. Metadata is enough. The proxy indicators tell us everything we want to know. And 50% is as good a rate of killing uh, by our drones as the best human intelligence that the CIA could get. Now, of course, social scientists engage with war. Of course, social scientists engage with 
imperialism, of course, social scientists engage with discrimination, with violence, with uh, nationalism, uh, religious politics, all of that. But I think it's important to also recognize that here are methods and tools of the social sciences being deployed and social scientists have no clue about it. We are making ethical judgments which are important, but uh, those um, that's it said the recording stopped. Is that okay? I think it's all right. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, um, so that's what I was saying that now you have these tools. So this is the thing. Now, why is metadata so important? Because through metadata, you computer scientists do what they call ontology. How do you define a thing? Right? What is a poem? What is sport? What is curiosity? What is anger? Now we do that, right? Humanists, social scientists do that all the time. But uh, often for purposes of our research, for the type of engagement we are in, um, intellectual engagement we are in, we don't perhaps want to define anything very specifically. Sometimes we want to keep the boundaries fuzzy, but the electric self-driving vehicle can't. It has to know whether it's a human being or it's a mannequin. Is it a cyclist or is it just a cycle kept on the side of the road. So you have to define the thing really well. And uh, these examples that I gave of poem or sport, curiosity, anger, actually come from students who came to me who were in this dual degree program. There was a different version earlier and that closed down. So some of them, uh, when I joined here, uh, uh, started working with me on their research. And you got into this thing. I mean, so a student came to me saying, um, I was working on a poetry generator. And we started talking about what does it mean to call a piece of text a poem? And somebody else was there talking about how do we uh, characterize sports? And can we build a formal grammar of sport that which can tell us that this is sport and that is not sport, even if they look similar? What about curiosity, anger? How do you define that? How will a computer know that you are angry? How will a computer, or anybody for that matter, right? A computer is just a proxy for another person here. How would they know you're being curious? Uh, we understand it intuitively often, uh, but that's just like a black box of the computer. How do we analyze that? So let's look at some of these examples, right? Uh, there's a poem which we write as prose. Um, so what is it other than um, the break-in lines, which is important, of course, what is it that uh, distinguishes prose from poem? So if you go... Um, uh, into uh, the definition of poem before the 20th century, there are very rigorous definitions of poems of what constitutes a poem and how is it distinct from prose. And that's not necessarily only in uh, the European context, it's global. So you look at Chinese, you look at Indian, I mean, and I mean, Indian is a really unhappy category. So you look at say, Sanskrit poetry, you look at poetry, in the different practices that emerged, uh, you look at the modern vernaculars, everywhere there's a very clear distinction between what is a poem and what is prose. And increasingly over the 20th century, you find that that distinction is breaking down. So people innovate, people extend boundaries, but how do you build a poetry generator? And then we said, forget about building a poetry generator. Let's just 
try and see, can we define a poem? And what is happening to the poem and the prose as two forms of literary expression in the modern period? So are poems dying out because poems increasingly look like prose as some people say? And how do you then define a poem? Is the, is the meter important? If a piece of text doesn't have a meter to structure it, is it still a poem? Are rhymes important? What about a rhythm and metaphors? You know, what form of experimentation is allowed? What is now not allowed? And when we started looking at uh, this, can we verify this computationally, looking at poems and prose? What is happening to these two? So the question, is the poem merging into the prose actually came much later. Here it's on the same slide, it came towards the end when we saw a result. So we wanted to see what, what is a prose, how do you define prose and how do you define poem? Just that took us a year because we were struggling with these concepts. Um, and I was very new to this. And we said, okay, let's look at poetry in the age of mechanical reproduction. We'll take text. Uh, uh, you know, looking at a time, uh, uh, the end of the long 19th century, as it were, um, the golden period of mechanical reproduction. Uh, what, uh, uh, so, you know, the 50 years, the end of the 19th century, the first uh, 22 decades of the 20th century. And then we sort of look at the last 30 years of the 20th century and the first 19, 20 years when these definitions are broken. And can we see, how do we then go about it? How do we define poems? And we found we couldn't use certain things. So we couldn't use semantic features, basically emotions like imagery, metaphors, sentiment, choice of words, themes. These don't work. Visual differences, basically line breaks. Again, they don't work because even a text, if you sort of publish it in a small format, the line breaks will be different. You know, So it's difficult to do that. We couldn't. So what we could use was grammar, meter and rhyme. And these we found that except for um, the late 19th century and definitely in the 20th century when these were given the go by, typically these were rules about how they are used and how they were core to the definition of a poem. So we did this, we looked at the grammar, for example. So as I was talking to you, rules, right? So we had all these rules. So this, the inversion of the adjective, the inversion of the subject, the verb, there is Yoda construction or a question, no, beginning with a conjunction, there were other rules too. So we looked at these and how those are worked with. We collected text from Goodreads for prose, large chunks from novels, primarily novels, a few short stories, and then poems. And then we had these classification models based on the meters, on the grammar, on rhyme, right? And once you give those rules, it looks at a text and says, oh, this is a poem and this is a prose. And when it makes a mistake, you sort of say, no, this is not prose, this is still a poem. And because it's still in this rule. And this is not a poem, this is a prose because of X and Y reasons. So you keep doing that and it learns. And the training models kept, we had to keep annotating that data. And soon enough, we were able to distinguish a poem from a prose based on these features, right? These features, the grammar, the meter, right, and the rhyme. And of course, there's a certain amount of accuracy, there's a certain amount of inaccuracy, which is there for any form of analysis. And what we found was, if you look at uh, the two periods that we're looking at, the divergence between prose and poem is actually collapsing. 
And uh, the graph actually goes ahead and sometime around 2040 or 2050, uh, the poem merges into the prose. So if any of you are poets here, um, yeah, this is your last call. You know, after that, you'll only be writing prose according to these uh, rules. And then, of course, we uh, sort of put them up and we basically found that today, basically, you know, a poem is self-certified. So I can write anything and say, this is a poem and that's it, right? It just, that's a poem. So there is no way I can actually look at a thing and that's a problem. I think it's a problem because self-certification is good, but to have a coherent conversation in any community, any society, you need to be able to agree on meaning. So if I look at something and say, oh, that's a duster, and you say, no, that's a pancake, that doesn't work. Um, or, you know, you look at me and call me Prachi, and you look at Prachi and call her Aniket, that doesn't work, right? Uh, so we need, we need uh, objective is a wrong word, perhaps, but we need sort of uh, across the board definitions, uh, which should work other than what I call it myself. And that has basically what we came up with was that that is not working anymore. The poem does not have a definition. The ontology has collapsed. So we, I'm giving you something else on formal ontology of sport. So when you look at a set of people or an individual doing something, can you look at it and be sure that this is sport? So if a person is running on the road, do you know that person is running a marathon or just trying to catch the 8 e bus uh, from Jadapur to Oriyat? How do you know? What defines sport? So basically you need to um, break it down into its constituent elements, Try and see what then becomes sport. So, for example, we so basically what we ended up doing was to take um, a set of sports, different types of sports, as you can see in the list of sports, uh, then break down them down into the events which together make it. There's a serializable factor, so one event moving into the other in a certain series, right? There are rules, so there are rules for each event. So you pass the ball in football, that's an event, right? But there are rules for that. And then there are game rules. Same with basketball, same with bowling, same with all of them. And then there's a termination point, which could either be a foul or you know something illegal or a point is gained or lost. So for example, this is just an illustration. What we did was to do this, the athlete enters the circle, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into this. These are the serializable factors in short put for a shot, right? And these are the event rules, these are the game rules. So you've broken them down into elements which now can be reconfigured computationally. So you can give it a graphical representation. And it tells you that, you know, what are the possible things once the athlete enters the circle with the shot, there are three possibilities. And two of them would lead to an immediate foul. The third does not. But after the third happens, then there are four possibilities. And that's it. That's the universe of possibilities, right? And three of them lead to a foul and only one leads to an updating of the score. So that's how this game works. And then you define it. And this is my event horizon of comprehension because my maths, like a good historian, is not really the best or rather pretty poor. Uh, that's a polite way of saying it. Um, but yeah, so you basically represent it, right? In a manner which is computationally understood. And you can then analyze hurdles, 
with shot puts. And you can analyze badminton with bowling. You can analyze many games. And you can then come up with a categorization of sports and how they work. And perhaps, and I don't need to, I mean, you're all PhD students here. I don't need to tell you really how, uh, I mean, what I'm doing here, but uh, there is a certain a methodological position. There's a, uh, the inductive method, right? But through this, I, you know, if you look at it, what is happening here, the boundaries between inductive and deductive are becoming blurry. And this was a master's work. So we could not take it further. But the ambition was that we could actually look at a lot of activities people do and say that, well, this looks quite like sport. So I used to joke with my student when we were doing this that, you know, the amount of uh, emotional attachment that uh, people in Bombay have with their local trains, I think the going to office from home in a local train and coming back is a form of sport. And if we actually do a formal categorization on ontology of sport and we sort of uh, computationally analyze the whole movement on local trains, it might be a sport. Otherwise, what explains the amount of emotional investment that people have in that terrible mode of transport? Or, you know, I haven't been in Calcutta public transport for the longest time, but I remember taking that 8B bus, which I referred to earlier from Jadapur to Goryahat often, and that was not the most convenient way of traveling. But nobody romanticizes that, but people do. So maybe we could do something else, identify things about what is happening. And again, I don't have time. I think I'm already running way short of time. Uh, Prachi, can I take half an hour more? I'm glad you're good. We, the class is up to 1 p.m. Uh, so we yeah. just so one thing, 12 30 30 questions, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Uh, you have yeah. So that's it. So, you know, you, I mean, in fact, again, a pointer to you that perhaps you could say, read up uh, somebody like Umberto Eco when he talks about sport and democracy and the linkages between spectator sport and democracy, and then bring in this work of characterizing sports computationally and being able to then look at any human activity, individual or social, or massive collective, and then get to theorizing. This is not possible unless one deep dives into computational social sciences. For example, curiosity, again. So a student came and said she was interested in curiosity, anger, uh, you know, emotions of this sort, uh, looking at uh, questions. Um, basically, you know, she had an interest in psychology and all. So, I mean, I'm not a psychology sort of scholar. I, but we said, okay, let's look at curiosity and let's try and see how do we look at curiosity. And one of the things, I won't go into the details, it took some time for us to identify clickbaits, you know, things. You won't even imagine what Prince Harry told, or well, he's not a prince anymore, right? Harry told Meghan. Or what was Biden doing um, when the Taliban was doing something? You know, clickbait. So you, you're not interested in that. You're doing something else. You have to go and catch that 8B bus, but you still click on it. It's clickbait. So why do people do that out of curiosity? And then there's, of course, various theories of curiosity. You have listed all of them. What we basically did was we went and captured headlines from three newspapers. And we looked at... Indian newspapers, English, to make it simpler, right? Uh, remember, these were all not PhD students. These were all master students. They had to finish their whole research and submit their thesis in a year. 
So you look at a serious newspaper, you look at a tabloidish newspaper, you look at an anti-establishment newspaper, different types, and you take their headlines and see how many times they're getting clicked, uh, how many times are they being shared on Twitter and Facebook, by how many, how wider range of people who are doing it, how wider range of time that is happening, right? And then you analyze news for content and style and try and see what is happening to curiosity. I won't go into details of that. What uh, little details I'll give you is what else that last year did was to look at how do we compute anger? How do we do a computational study of anger? And what we looked at was the outrage that happened with the Jyoti Singh rape murder in 2012 and Gauri Lankesh's killing in 2000, when was this, uh, 17, 18, right? Uh, just around the time when she was working on this. And we looked at Facebook for Jyoti Singh and Twitter for Gauri Lankesh. We looked at uh, something like seven and a half thousand posts in 40 public groups on Facebook. Uh, humongous amounts of textual data running into lakhs and lakhs of words because, of course, Facebook doesn't have a limit on how much you can post. We looked at more than 100,000 tweets from more than 40,000 handles and 11,000 plus 12,000, close to 12,000 hashtags. And we looked at how emotions get built up in these virtual communities. What triggers the outrage? When does outrage get triggered? What is the life history of outrage? Right? How does it work? And I'm not showing this here, but she was reading Habermas's um, idea of the public sphere. Uh, she was reading political theories of uh, what happens to civil society engagement, uh, what, you know, trying to bring both of those two things together. What is civic engagement and anger and disgust and how they work? And rather than going into details because we are running short of time, I'll just show you what happens. So for example, when you're looking, we do, do a sentiment analysis of the words that are used when Gauri Lankesh is there. Mind you, these are tweets. These are tweets from before Twitter allowed uh, 280 characters. It used to be still 140 characters. So very few, very positive words. There's a bunch of neutral words, of course, because that will be the basis of most language, but you look at very negative words the negative words and the very negative words, right? And you look at Nirdhya, um, again, the number of neutral words is more because it's more longer, bigger prose, but again, very strong. But what you do realize is um, how much more polarized and angry uh, social media is uh, six, seven years after uh, Jyoti Singh Nirbhaya's uh, incident to when Gauri Lankesh happens because the very negative words are far stronger and far more. And then you do a word cloud. I mean, these are things you can, these are, these are things which any of you can do. You can download their easy Twitter APIs. You can download those and, you know, look at the words that are being used. You can analyze where it's coming from, the location, the timing, uh, it's very interesting to see at what time does outrage happen? Does it happen early in the evening, late at night? Why is it happening in that manner? You know, uh, what are the words being used? Um, how important they are? Uh, how does it, you know, into that? And what we found, for example, um, well, actually, it should be both Jyoti Singh and, uh, well, this is only Jyoti Singh, but uh, there's also, yeah, the Gauri Lankesh one is the next one. Um, so yeah, we saw that, you know, there's this sharing. So things are happening and people are sharing like mad. They're expressing their outrage. They're expressing their solidarity through sharing and liking. And you see sharing and liking happen almost together, though liking goes on for longer because it is sort of, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly uh, lighter form of expressing uh, your opinions and emotions on social media. And you see a similar pattern here, which basically the, the lesson it gives us is that if governments 
want, they can basically ride out outrage and anger on social media because it peaks, it's deafening, but it falls really quickly. And we know that, right? We see how that happens. I mean, we are living through that right now. So you might outrage as much as you want, but if the government has a thick enough skin, they can basically ride it out. It doesn't work. But there were other things we found, which was really interesting, I haven't put it here, that it does happen at times that, especially in Facebook, that outrage often leads to conversations. Now that is an interesting and positive uh, finding from our study, that often conversations are building up. People, who were not connected to each other are now getting connected and talking to each other. That's, that's an interesting thing. Again, I haven't shown it here because uh, uh, already running short of time. Um, these are things I've already um, told you. I just wanted to refresh your memory about this, about big data, right? It's, um, it allows, uh, it basically works on the fact that everything is converted into bits and bytes. And these are these millions and millions well beyond the capability of humans to analyze this. But what happens? Right? We talked about the fact that it is difficult to explain this. There's this black box which comes up. So one of the big things is how do you explain the black box? How do you get computers to tell you how they have reached a decision, why a certain outcome and why some, not something else. And explainable AI is again something really big um, and computer scientists right now work on it, but we need anthropologists, sociologists, uh, philosophers, social theorists of all forms, humanists, social scientists of all forms to engage in this discussion because what exactly is to be explained, how is it to be explained, what does it do to our societies? We can see the trends, we don't know why those results came out, how they were calculated. And you know, we see them all over the place. For example, insurance claims, people get rejected all the time and different times, different people. Of course, insurance companies are basically legalized scams, but Still, within that, there's a certain system. We still don't know. The insurance wallers don't know why certain premiums come up and why it doesn't, because it's going through this black box. And of course, chat box is this famous thing about Microsoft building this chat, uh, you know, which was talking to the other chat bot. I mean, now you, whether you order food or you order uh, buy a, you know, airline ticket, train ticket, anything, there's a little chat box which comes up and starts answering your questions, right? Now they had these two chatbots talking to each other and soon they developed a language nobody understood and they were still communicating to each other, et cetera, et cetera. I've talked about the maths proof. I mentioned AlphaGo Zero. I'll speak a little about that. So what AlphaGo Zero did was, uh, of course, I'm sure you know about how, you know, uh, the computers were taught to play chess and they beat Kasparov. That was well in the nineties. And then the next big frontier was the game called Go, which is far more complex. Apparently, uh, the number of moves, possible moves in, uh, in Go is uh, more than uh, the number of stars in the universe. Or I, I don't know. I mean, it's an impossibly large number, which for human purposes is infinite, right? Even if it is mathematically not defined as infinite, it's like, humongously large. Now, Go, so first we had AlphaGo, which was trained on uh, Google's uh, this DeepMind software, which basically trained this on hundreds of thousands of recorded Go games. That this move, that person does this. This move, the other person does that. This is how you beat the other person. This is how successful moves happen. So AlphaGo trained on tens of thousands of those human games, lacks actually. And that allowed AlphaGo to then beat a human player. 
And then you had the self-learning thing. So this was humans training them. So it looks at many, many, many games. And it, of course, has a memory where nothing is ever forgotten. And then it uses that to play with humans and defeat the human player. But the next step, which is where we are now, is the self-learning, the, um, uh, the generalized AI, which is where they're not, the AlphaGo Zero was not trained with data and strategy from humans. It was not shown anything. It was just told the rules of Go and it kept playing itself for a couple of days. And then it played with a human player. And there's this famous thing called Move 37. You could look up YouTube, look, look up, you know, there are all these computer science conferences where there are whole panels discussing Move 37 because nobody knows why AlphaGo Zero played Move 37 because it was completely meaningless or it's an impossible move. It doesn't make sense at all. Everyone thought this is the most stupid thing. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Move thirty seven on that game just did not make sense in the few centuries that or thousand years that Go has been played. Nobody has done that move apparently. It just didn't make sense. But later, when the gameplay was analyzed, that was the move which allowed AlphaGo Zero to beat the human player. And nobody really knows how that happened and why this was an autonomous decision-making process, which is not explainable. There are legal issues, right? Who owns, for example, who owns the intellectual property for products, for texts, for codes, for decisions? Who owns up to it? And as of now, there is actually no legal consensus globally, despite this huge legal and extra legal architecture that you have of the WTO, the WIPO, the UN bodies, the various other um, uh, trade agreements, et cetera, et cetera, the various forms of uh, uh, patent laws, intellectual property laws that you have. I mean, the basic thing is still unsure that does a software get a patent or a copyright? Is a software a machine or text? Because copyright is for text, patent is for a machine, a product. And a software is both. And now, of course, we have things like, uh, you know, the GDPR rules in the European Union that, you know, Companies, you cannot deploy AI, which cannot explain itself. You have to, there has to be oversight on autonomous decision-making, there's human responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. But as scholars, if you look at it, it's basically, you know, it's, it's a band-aid. It's not really solving the problem. The GDPR is a method to empower citizens because corporations are so Amazon, Google is telling you what to do, what to eat, where to go, what train to take, what road to take, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we are constantly getting influenced. However much we think we are not, we're constantly getting influenced. Because we live in a world where it is in a sense generalized. So even if you don't want to use a smartphone with all these features, everybody else is doing, and that does impact you. So GDPR rules and changes in accountability, human accountability, et cetera, et cetera, certain rules on what AI can do and should do and is allowed to are all important to empower citizens. But is there something else we can do to sort of, uh, deal with this digital panopticon that there is? Can citizens reverse the gaze? Can we do what these big entities do to us as citizens, as consumers, by reversing that gaze, by using those same very tools? Because some of those tools, just like AI is becoming generalized, those tools are getting generalized. It's easy to use. 
So with another student, I did something similar where we said, okay, let's try and reverse the digital gaze. So can we use available IT tools to gain knowledge and information about large organizations? Create a visual structure of an organization which does not tell us too much about itself. Can we, using social network analysis, find something about it? So initially, actually, uh, we, we had thought of a bunch of things. We looked at the Congress party. He was interested in politics. So we said, look, sir, look at the Congress party. Uh, the other thing we were looking at was the CPIM in West Bengal. Uh, finally, we settled on the Rashtra Swayam Sevak Sun because uh, this was a couple of years after Narendra Modi had become prime minister in 2014. And there was a lot of interest in what was happening in what the inner dynamics of the Sun Parivar were. And can we understand what is happening as citizens to the party which is ruling us? So this is what we did. We set conditions and boundaries for ourselves, gather only legitimate publicly available data, use only freely available tools, right? No interviews or personal interactions. And minimal use of secondary literature. Just by reversing the panopticon, the type of gaze that these big corporations and entities bring on us, using these, can we do the reverse on them? Can we get workable, interesting information? So this was the methodology. We collect all the information about all the... So one of the little secondary literature we did was we went to Anderson Damley's book, got a list of all the... Um, yeah, Anderson Damley's book and Manjri Kardu's book. We got all the list, the, the list of all the organizations which form what is popularly called the Sangh Parivar. Right. Then we identify there are more than a hundred, right? So um, not more than a hundred, I think a few hundred, if memory serves me right. But so what we decided was we took the most important ones of them, about a dozen or so, identified all the principal actors in each organization. Again, a web search tells you that. Find news and information about these principal actors. Make a network map of all the organizations and all the individual actors. So a person could be, um, uh, say, for example, the RSS has a very influential lawyer's body, the uh, Akhil Bharatiya Abhivakta Parishad. I think that's what, it, if memory serves me right. Or Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad or Bharatiya Mazdur Sang. So, you know, a person is a member of the uh, lawyer's organization. He is also a member of the Bar Council. He might be a member of um, uh, uh, the local rot Rotary Club. He might be a member of the um, Parent Teacher Association of the local school, whatever. You know, you build a network map of all the principal actors. You build a network map of all the organizations. You identify using just searching the news and the websites, right? The information on the websites. We don't open up websites, backends or anything. Just look at what is publicly available. Download the information using legal, publicly available and typically free tools or extremely inexpensive tools. So you find the trajectories of movements of individuals within this universe and how they're clustering around topics, around time, around geographical area. It, it's not very difficult. It all this happens. And one of the things we found, for example, is that in the uh, three years, uh, or three, four years, three years, 2015 to 2017, 15, 16, 17, yeah. Um, we found that basically this was the network map which came up, right? Um, the interesting thing is you will see that, uh, I mean, let me just, what does it show? I, actually, I should have put the map and this together. What does it show? It shows that the RSS remains the organization with the maximum linkages within the Sang Parivar. Every node is linked to the RSS. There's no organization or individual who's not linked to the RSS, right? But the density of linkages has shifted to the BJP. The BJP is now, in that sense, the center of the Sang Parivar universe, right? And this is just, as, again, a small thing. 
it would be really interesting to see 2004 to 2014 and not just compare across time, but it would be really, really interesting to understand Indian, uh, Indian politics if, for example, we then look at the Congress and compare it with the Sangh Parivar, then within the Sangh Parivar, maybe compare the BJP and the VHP and the uh, um, ABVP, I don't know, I mean, some of those organizations, maybe within the uh, Congress compare them, uh, maybe look at, so it would, as a PhD, say, uh, research agenda, this will be completely doable. So what I'm telling you was done in less than a year, all the analysis, all the writing, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it opens up new ways in which we can study the polity, the economy, the social organization, what the hell uh, is Coca-Cola doing? What the hell is um, Amazon doing here? Just using these very tools. We did another thing, another research, which was to look at the religious history of Spiti, which was uh, part of uh, what I was doing uh, as my research project uh, on a project with ICSSR. One of my students worked with me on that. And we said, we'll look at um, everyday religion for the purposes of his uh, MS thesis, right? And using GIS. So we uh, looked at uh, the Spiti region, uh, you know, these are maps and basically taken these from his uh, thesis. So we selected basically 25, villages in Spiti. And we took a GPS, so where's my GPS? So I'll show it to you later, but yeah, we took my uh, GPS device because at that time there was no um, GPS, uh, there was no internet and uh, you couldn't use mobile phones uh, in Spiti. Uh, so we used that, we used questionnaires, in-person interviews, observations, taking photographs to try and see everyday religion, right? And for that, we identified the Chotan. The Chotan are these small stupas. If you look at the Buddhist Himalayas, you will see these little stupas all over the place. And there are various types of them, you know, different parts have different types. They represent different things. I will not sort of get into that, but these are like, you know, I thought it's been very dull. So towards the end, uh, put in some pretty photographs of uh, Spiti, for you to look at. So we put up all of, we, we took these photographs, we geotagged them, uh, the coordinates on the map, but also the altitude, et cetera, et cetera. We took photos of these from various aspects, right? Various things, agricultural fields in the city, in the towns for, you know, um, for protecting the village, for commemorating illnesses and protection from illnesses, to commemorate an important religious figure, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is basically, we looked at uh, more, than a, more than 300 of these sites. And finally, for an ana analysis, took about 283 of these Chotans in Spiti. Right? And what we did was use an open source uh, GIS software, which is called QGIS, right? And we basically use that to plot all the Chortons with habitations, with agriculture, with roads, with the other forms of uh, infrastructure in those um, villages. And this is how it looks like. Say, for example, you go to Gyu village um, and uh, this, you can actually clearly see, this is the, this is actually one of the better visuals we got. You see the agricultural areas and these, um, five uh, triangles are the Chortons, right? And these are the Chortons which were basically protecting the village. Um, traditionally, these are the, like, the guards, the spiritual guards for the village. And, and the others, like there's this Chicham village, you can see the habitation, this is not as clear, but you can see the agricultural fields to the bottom and uh, the bare mountains on the top of the picture. And you can see the small buildings all over and you can see the placements of the Chorton. Uh, another village, you again see agricultural land, you see barren areas, you see habitation. Um, this uh, satellite picture is when from uh, October, I think, so there was already snow there. 
So again, you see some habitations, you see um, agricultural land, which is now snowed over, and you see the location of the Jortons, right? So basically, what do we do at the end of it? So we looked, basically what we did was we put three layers, agriculture, areas, habitation, religion. And from talking to people there, we know that Chortons are typically religious structures which are used to protect. Now, if you look at this in Gyu village, for example, up here in the top left, you see that the Chortons typically are along the agricultural area, but the agricultural area is extending, going beyond. But the habitations typically are still within that. But if you look at the top right, uh, you'll see that the habitations again are there, but the agricultural fields are spilling all over the place and they're not protected anymore by the Chortons. Uh, bottom left is the most interesting comic where you see the Chortons make a small triangle, both habitations, and agriculture spilling out, as is in bottom right, Telling Village, where again, agriculture, because of new, what is called North Old Land, irrigation from glacial melts is extending well beyond. And now you can see actually individual houses, these yellow marks are the individual houses that are coming up well outside the area of the Chorton. So which then allows us to actually talk about something like the secularization of life there, how Chortons are becoming more spectacle and less of a function of social life, right? Uh, and of course, spectacle itself has a function, but you know, uh, you get my point here. Uh, I hope, uh, and it helps us here make an argument about the breakdown of older community forms and their replacement with new forms of modernity, uh, things like that. And I'll take uh, just five more minutes to give you a quick overview of some of the other uh, research uh, that uh, I've done. And most of this has been just semester long. So I, uh, I mean, there's not too much to show. So for example, one of once we started working on dowry. So what we did was we collected all the court documents from all the high courts and Supreme Courts relating to dowry. Right, uh, we are trying to convert them from PDF into machine readable text, uh, but then we gave up that project. But uh, even PDFs allow for a fair amount of analysis. What we were trying to do is identify trends, predict events. So just like um, you know, the CIA predicts where the uh, you know. Uh, the Taliban is supposed to be. I mean, of course, as you now see, the predictions weren't all that good, but I, you know, whatever. Uh, we see that, uh, can we predict, can we see, can we say, for example, map the role of gold over social, territorial, economic, educational landscapes? I mean, where does gold play? What role does gold play? Who's given? Hello, I, I think we've had a minor uh, glitch here. Uh, I think we've lost Aniket. Uh, so just wait and uh, uh, wait for him to reconnect. Yes, he's back. Aniket, can you hear us? You're, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize that. 
been sort of locked out. Uh, so where was I that uh, that moment? You were you were talking about the uh, Spiti Valley, the Chortens, and the uh, and the uh, second. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So. I think I think it's kind of frozen the screen again for some reason. Okay, so I've gone. Was I here? Maybe the screen sharing is causing some problems, Anikit. But uh, we can still hear you. Aniket, can you hear us? Yeah. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, I think it's a screen sharing. For some reason, the screen sharing is kind of breaking the... Uh, yeah, there's a... Let me, let me try and share it from my computer, Aniket. Yeah, that'll, that'll be okay, great. Okay, let me just try it once, and if it doesn't, then we we'll go back. Okay. Does this work? It is working, yes. Okay, so was I here? Um, no, actually. Here? Uh, just checking. So you were speaking about the dowry logo, dowries. Oh, so I had crossed Spiti, yeah. right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So yeah. So dowry. So we did this uh, study. We basically uh, took all the uh, documents, all the the entire judgments, like running sometimes into hundreds of pages uh, from all the high courts and supreme court. So these are all appeals, right? Um, but they have a huge amount of data. They carry on a lot of the sort of information from the sessions courts, the criminal courts. And uh, we can we try to convert them into machine readable text, but this 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 went on for only a semester. But the idea was to identify how different things link up. I mean, which part of the family? So, what is the role of the mother-in-law? What is the role of the father-in-law? Does it change in Kerala from Chhattisgarh and from uh, Andhra Pradesh to Gujarat and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, you know, you can identify trends and perhaps you can even predict events of what is happening and uh, why is it happening and uh, can things be done to stop it but even if you're not looking at policy to try to stop it just to analyze the family to analyze what is happening to the family to analyze what is happening to uh, you know dowry itself to domestic violence some of these things uh, the what can be done with this research is quite interesting uh, the other thing, uh, two students, they were computer science students who came and they uh, wanted to work on nationalism. Uh, they're not uh, my MS students who were partly doing humanities. So they wanted to look at invented traditions. So what we did was we try and identify traditions which emerged in the 20th century. And, and we used uh, keywords to look at everything that was already digitized, PDFs or any other form uh, all over the web uh, used almost a month uh, these scholars trying to find these i won't give you i mean so there were the regular ones i mean you know things we know for example that came later so whether it's food or clothes or you know uh, i mean to give you examples like for example um, we know that uh, um, Cottage cheese, you know, paneer or chana is something new, or tea is new, or sari is new, or, you know, um, there are various other things. Um, Ganesh Chaturthi is new, uh, Durga Puja is new. I mean, the way it is done, the Sharvajanic manner. So, all these things and various other things. What we found very interesting was a link between interested, invented traditions and geography geographical indicator applications at the 
you know, the WIPO. So most of those who are going, whether it's Darjeeling tea or Rasagulla or, you know, various other things, these are all invented traditions, which now we are claiming as a form of a geographical indicator. There are fights between states in India. India is fighting with Pakistan and Nepal over, you know, Basmati rice, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are in some ways invented tradition. What was really surprising for us, I mean, I'm not a sociologist, anthropologist, but what was really surprising is that in the 19th century, for example, you don't hear of the Jajmani system. You hear of Jajmans, but there is no reference to the Jajmani system till the 20th century. So the whole idea of the Jajmani system, which is now quite sort of uh, central to sociological uh, writings on India, is perhaps an invented tradition. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just a uh, semester-long thing. Uh, there's another thing, project, which I uh, discussed with a student, but then it didn't work out because he had other things uh, work. So, but we're thinking of, can we use GIS mapping and network analysis to try and understand, look at Benedict Anderson's whole concept of these pilgrimage journeys of uh, these cadets of, the new nation states or the old nation states, how they are moving, where they are moving, what does it do to nationalism as an ideology, what does it do to the nation state, et cetera, et cetera, legitimacy, things like that. Um, constitutionalism, how do we study constitutions, break it down into structures, like we saw earlier, you know, all these things. I'm rushing through this, but one of my students, she actually did an MS thesis on this to study preambles and try to correlate that with political, social, economic factors, and do these preambles give clues to nation-state trajectories? And this uh, thing uh, actually got selected for one of the top political science uh, journals on this study, not a computational journal, it's a political science journal. Um, students have worked with me on music and culture. So what we basically did, they were interested in music. Um, so they said, let's look at popular music. So we basically picked up Benaka Mala from 1950 to 1999, 50 years of it, top 20 songs from each year. And then we collected the lyrics. Uh, we analyzed it according to singers, male, female, um, how much does a male sing? How much does a female sing? Um, the themes, the words, the Hindi, Urdu words, uh, you know, uh, romance, how many of them are about romance? How many of them are about other things? Passive, aggressive voice. Uh, very interesting. I mean, again, it, it's not it's not surprising, but uh, interesting that uh, women have more passive voice than men do in these songs, right? Uh, but you could do hundreds of other things with it. You could sort of, uh, we could have done visual image analysis. How are women shown? How is that changing over time? You know, plot analysis with the song and the music, correlations with other broader social, political, economic. So I'll conclude now. Basically, this long-winded talk, uh, slightly incoherent at times, uh, is about the fact that they are now computers, computational tools are ubiquitous. They are happening all the time. My sense now, and here I'm sticking my neck out to say that uh, I think the change that is happening, the impact that they have had is akin to what happened with the printing, coming of the printing press, coming of electricity, um, uh, you know, uh, it is transformational in the foundational sense. And they're changing society, the way we study society, knowledge as a category itself. And we are inside the machine, whether we know it or not. And I think it's important to become self-conscious of it and start engaging with it because it's a long journey ahead before we become, uh, we are able to deal with it in some sort of a reflexive manner. I'll stop here. I'm sorry I've taken much longer than I had intended to, but I'm happy to take questions. Can I uh, stop sharing the screen so that it doesn't uh, go off again? Yeah. Thank you, Anuket. Um, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, just the, the sort of sheer range of, of topics, possibilities, uh, you know, the technological, uh, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
actual sort of uh, cognitive problems that are involved in, in, in uh, using these technologies, working with them, thinking through social issues uh, through them. It's, uh, it's just a, a, a really wonderful introduction to, to all of us. And we are practically bursting with, with questions, uh, I know. So I'll go straight to, to uh, people and say, if you have questions, uh, please just mention in the chat that um, uh, you want to ask a question um, and I will call on you. Uh, if you wish, please put your uh, questions in the chat box itself. I can read them out uh, to Aniket. We will also have them later on if we can't get to all of them. So, um, yeah, Patrick, can uh, we just first have one or two chat comments? I mean, just give my throat a moment to rest before we. Definitely. Um, uh, do you want to take questions together? Um, my Ideally, name. if I can take two or three together, that's best. But I'm also happy to take individual questions. That's not a much. Okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, show me still here. I can. Uh, uh, yes, Prachidi, I'm here. Uh, do you want to kick off the, the q and I, I do have, have a question, have if nobody yes. else goes first. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, shall I ask here or write in the chat, I mean, as you... You ask me. I'll call so, on somebody else. So, I, I'm, uh, thank you for this fascinating talk, Aniket. I mean, I was like totally uh, like mind blown, especially with the Spiti Valley project. This is something, you know, is fantastic, really. So I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how, how, would you, how would you, or is it possible at all to analyze emotions and affect uh, using digital uh, technology? I mean, I was thinking of Move 37 that you mentioned in AlphaGo. Mm -hmm. in, in response to Move 37, uh, Lee Seidel actually played Move 78 after I think three days or a few days, and uh, mm -hmm. it was an emotional reaction. Uh, uh, and uh, it was he described Move 37 as a beautiful move, and then he responded with his own. So uh, when we're looking at sports, I'm, I mean I work on games mainly digital games, but when we're looking at sports, there's also an emotional angle to it. So uh, is it possible to data analyze uh, the affective part? Of yeah, see, some of it is happening. You know, uh, basically, what is happening is that uh, certain behavioral psychology is predominant uh, in uh, uh, computer science analysis. So there is this. So when I was working with my student on, you know, looking at anger and curiosity, so it's a very behavioral yes. psychology uh, which is uh, being deployed. Uh, but I don't see why we cannot. Uh, draw on other theories, whether it's Jungian or Freudian, uh, to understand emotions or move out of the realm of psychology to just say, uh, um, sort of, you know, the, the, the thing uh, the to, so just let, to finish, uh, to say, for example, uh, do a history of emotions like um, people in the annals uh, tradition have done, hmm. uh, or uh, people like Robert Danton or uh, Carlo yes. Ginsburg have done. Um, I think it's fairly possible. Now I feel confident to say that it is possible, that it is uh, not just possible, that it is really important to do that because now we have those materials in hand, we have those abilities in hand. And uh, it is uh, almost, um, you know, I, I mean, to use a strong word, it's almost criminal that uh, not enough attention is being paid to it. And typically what is happening is there are people who are computer scientists who are interested in the world who then move in and try and work on uh, social historical issues. Whereas uh, the flow from the other side is, um, you know, either non-existent or really small. So to give a straight answer, yes, we can do that. We can. Uh, so, for example, I was recently looking at this paper, which is very interesting, which, um, which basically uses historical texts and archaeological remains to do a, a social network analysis, plotting it on a territorial map, a GIS map uh, of uh, um, uh, a city in the Mediterranean. 
And there is already a history which says that this was the most important person and that was the most important trader and this is what happened. Whereas if you use computational tools, social network analysis, you try, you basically end up with a very different view of that city and trade and political power and who's important and who's not. Um, similarly, uh, you know, our emotions do get embedded in uh, material objects, how we use them. This is how archaeologists have worked all the time. Um, not just archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, um, you know, beyond th these disciplinary boundaries. So I don't see why they can't uh, be uh, sort of, why can't we do this? I mean, we make mistakes, uh, some silly ones, some deep-rooted ones, which will take uh, maybe a generation or two to identify and come out. But, you know, when has that stopped people and why, why should it stop us? I mean, you know, that's a given. We'll make mistakes. We'll make do things wrong. But uh, I don't see why it can't be done. Sorry, a long-winded, uh, important answer. Thanks. But uh, Thank you very yeah, much. that's basically it. Um, we, have, we have some questions in the chat box. Uh, Anke, do you want me to, to read them out to you or, or will you... Uh, yeah, I can also read them. Um, uh, if it's simpler, whichever is better for you. Uh, so there's uh, on the Dow. Oh, okay, that was yeah. a really okay. Shagata uh, the one uh, after the dowry comment. That yeah. is the first question. Thank you. So it's okay if I read it silently, right? Yeah, go ahead. Actually, let me read it up because our YouTube viewers may not be able to okay. see. The chat. Sure. So, um, the question is, if we were to relate the use of AI and ML with the actor network theory, which posits that nothing exists outside networks of relationships as a methodological and theoretical approach, how do we then look towards its shortcomings as an applied method? And considering there are other ethical and uh, socio-political economic aspects to research alongside data, where possibilities and outcomes can lie outside those prescribed set of relationships or networks? Um, yeah, so the thing is that uh, it's not as if the actor network theory uh, gives us all answers, right? Uh, so like I tell my students that any methodology that you use, uh, one should always be careful of what its limitations are, even before one starts talking about its strengths and why you are using them. Uh, why you are using them cannot, that answer cannot be given unless you know what its limitations are. Um, that comes first, right? So, of course, the actor network theory doesn't tell us everything. Um, in some ways, uh, there are certain ethical issues, as you point out, uh, which it is agnostic about. But it does tell us a lot of things we don't know, right? And uh, nothing stops us from jumping boundaries, uh, uh, breaking uh, boundaries, uh, dipping into other bags uh, from the bag that we have right now to try and build a more wholesome picture. So of course the actor network theory can tell us a lot about. So for example, I showed you uh, uh, how the RSS universe works. It tells us nothing about the ethics uh, or the politics of the RSS. Uh, but it does not also prevent us from saying that, right? Um, we can very well make judgments on it. And whether it's the RSS, whether it's the CPM in West Bengal, whether it's uh, the Coca-Cola company, anything, any of those, right? So I don't think uh, one should, uh, you know, the, the search for a method which answers everything uh, is, I think, uh, best avoided. Uh, Methods are always limited. Methods are always context-driven. Methods are always conditional. And they have a range of limitations. Um, and we need to be aware of that and work with them. Uh, so the next one, let me read this, uh, Prachi. Uh, yeah. Shuruchi Mujumdar, right? Uh, hello, thanks for the wonderful presentation. You spoke about the critiques of big data. Just one small question in this context. As social science researchers, do we face any ethical dilemma when we are able to re reverse the panopticon? 
and study big organizations such as the RSS that are known to have exploited such technologies routinely. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether RSS actually does too much. Maybe it does. Uh, one doesn't really know. But yeah, the state definitely does. And when RSS people sit in the state uh, positions of state power, they do use that. But when they won't, some others will use it. Uh, ethical issues uh, with reversing the panopticon, there would well be, I mean, on anything that you study, there's always the question of what are the ethics of that. So, for example, we obviated that, uh, both the ethical and the legal, um, uh, by saying that we are not going to do anything illegal. So, we are going to just look at uh, what is available on the website, what is available through Google News, right? Uh, there are things which are not available through Google News. So suppose we could have said, okay, we are going to go and try and get stuff from the Times of India servers and from the um, you know Hindu servers and the Express servers and whatever else, uh, which they are not openly available. Maybe let's try and see if we can get something from the websites, which uh, you know they have not put up publicly, but they are available with an easy thing. We can get backdoor entry. We said we are not going to do that. We are not going to use expensive uh, software tools. We're just going to use what is commonly available uh, to pick up uh, by students who have perhaps done two years of a computer science course. Right? Uh, but yes, any study would have that problem. You are looking at things uh, where uh, people are involved. So. You know, uh, if you are getting, so if you are getting into interviews, if you are getting into talking about personal lives of people, if you are looking at what they are doing, then of course it is a problem. We need uh, ethics committees. Uh, we need to think about it. We, there are protocols about it. But uh, I mean, there is no one size fits all answer again for this. But it is important, and, and thank you for raising the question that there is an ethical dilemma when. You reverse the gaze uh, to the panopticon. I mean, I suppose the guards who are sitting in the panopticon looking at the prisoners also have human rights, right? So, as the police keep reminding us, the police has human rights. Uh, Prachi. Prachi, why don't you read out your own question? Okay. So, um... You know, as you were talking, I was I was just thinking continuously. This temptation is there among traditional historians, and I'm counting myself among them, to compare this moment of tech transformation with earlier ones. Uh, you know, like print or even earlier the invention of writing. And yeah. this uh, this question comes up again and again about how we treat this moment as one of amplification, basically, of earlier processes of communication, preservation, uh, uh, data, however spectacular, you know, in their amplification, and how we can even comprehend it as a cognitive shift, you know, which we may not understand now, but which may emerge only a kind of couple of generations down the, the, the line. Uh, like people have said with, with print or with invention of writing, you know, whether these are just kind of technologies or these actually brought about kind of cognitive shifts in the way we understand what, what memory is and what, what preservation uh, is. So that I was wondering, you know, how, do, how do the insights we have about this tech moment and this ambiguity, how can this help people like myself who work on, say, the transition from manuscript to print culture or from plurality to, to writing, uh, you know, or other comparisons to AST um, across these broad uh, and the right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, it's true that um, it's a bit of a, you know, one, when one is caught in the moment, you always think you're living in historical times, like really important, the greatest moment or the biggest tragedy or whatever else. And then, uh, so I take that part of it, but I think, uh, um, and that debate will never go. So maybe a hundred years down the line, we could perhaps uh, shift the point at which uh, we say that the big transformation happened and whether it was computer. So, I mean, there's a whole thing about whether it was print or whether it was the discovery of hydrocarbon or was it the 
um, uh, you know, the uh, the question of the you know the idea of a heliocentric uh, universe, except or capitalism. Uh, what was it that triggered? And that debate still hasn't gone. So I suppose this debate will still go on. But I was just actually um, talking at a slightly um, uh, one level lower. Uh, my uh, plea was that uh, typically social scientists either use uh, computer science tools unreflexively or they tend to get uh, overawed uh, by, you know, oh my God, this is this dystopic world which is taking everything over. Or saying that, you know, it's just these uh, tech bros who, you know, want to sort of uh, feel they are prophetic and big. So when they are not shooting themselves off into space, they sort of uh, try and tell us how they has changed the world. I think there is something really foundational and different that is happening and which is, you know, the point I made that um, I think human cognition at some level and human ability at some level have now, uh, we, it's, I mean, yeah, you can hypothetically, you can do a thought experiment, say that, you know, there's a nuclear winter and everything's gone back to uh, the pre-industrial age. But outside of those uh, situations, I think it is impossible to now think of human beings outside of the machine, right? Uh, you could still do that in the 19th century. You could still have that romantic moment, uh, even in the 20th century for much of the world. I don't think that's possible, even if you're sitting... Um, in the metaphorical Kalahandi or Ethiopia or, you know, Mali, let us say, Timbuktu. Uh, it's, you are in the machine. It's impossible to be out of the machine. And I think it's important for us to be reflexive about that. And maybe we'll come to a decision or a sort of understanding that, yeah, it's not that big a difference. It's a big difference of degree. Uh, it's not a difference of quality, but uh, even the difference of degree, we need to understand and work with it. And the other thing which I was trying to say here and which I've now tried started talking about in the last one year informally, and this is the second time I'm doing this formally, is to tell my uh, peers in the social science and humanities worlds that uh, we really have, you know, we are missing the bus uh, and we really need to get on to this. We need to engage with this. It, it is there. The archive has changed completely. And uh, we need to know what this archive is, what this new archive is. Right? Uh, it's not just about um, the digitizing of old documents. Uh, the archive that is being created while we are at it, I mean, how does this work? How does it get used? Who gets used? I mean, everybody gets access to this archive. What does that do to the archive, the definition of the archive? And, uh, you know, the, the way that data is kept, the way that data links up with everything. I don't even know where to start thinking of that, frankly. I mean, I just know that uh, all those things are, you know, everything is up in the air and we really need to engage with that. I mean, you talk about the public sphere in your question. What exactly is the public sphere now? The public sphere, of course, there are national public spheres. We know that. We live it, right? Uh, we live those dystopias. But uh, there's also a public sphere which is global. There's a public sphere which is extremely niche. Uh, 100 people following one passion all over the world at the same time and extremely engaged with each other and uh, influencing things outside that. I, I don't think... Uh, um, starting from Aristotle to Habermas I, or anybody else in that uh, trajectory, I don't think we, we have the tools, conceptual tools to understand what it is. Does the word public sphere still make sense? So I think, you know, the, the foundations have changed. Is it like printing? Was printing like printing what we call it? I don't know. Uh, but I would stick my neck out and say it is a really major shift. Thank you. That, that's, that's an excellent, very thoughtful. The very answer. time, you know, Prashi, the time that is taken. I mean, uh, this student of mine, Sujay, uh, I mean, I have done PhDs, and now that he's got his uh, thesis, uh, he's got his degree and uh, everything, uh, I can say that. I mean, the amount of work he's done for his MS, uh, I don't think uh, outside of maybe a dozen PhDs, anybody does that. And he could just bring it all together in a year and present it. And the other thing he's done, which we have not even uh, 
put up here is that he is building a whole public website of all the religious places in Spiti and going to hand it over to uh, a civil society organization in Spiti. This is all part of MS work. And it's not, you know, it's not something that he, I mean, he, he, he's a really hardworking student, but then all of the people I presented their works on are hardworking students. And the, the volume of work, the level of analysis that you can do is, uh, you know, it just changes research agendas totally. Uh, there's one more question, Anikit, uh, from yeah. Shonita Mukherjee. Yeah, just a sec. Okay, yeah, Shonita Mukherjee. Thank you so much, Professor Alam, for that fascinating talk and presentation. My question is, can we data analyze or use computational techniques for studying political communication or political psychology to study mass behavior? The answer to that question definitely is a big yes. Absolutely. They're doing it all the time. All the time. I mean, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing about Facebook was this. Right and really successful. So there's been all these critiques of the ocean uh, categorization and all that, right? But the fact is, some of it was was effective. Was it very effective? Was it less effective? What were its failures? We don't know. But it was effective. In that case, how can we use a big data sample? What can be the challenges and possibilities? What are the limitations and possibilities of studying gaze and doing visual ethnography, like studying festival and politics? Um, you know, I suspect that you are still thinking analog. Um, there is nothing called a big data sample, right? Uh, big data is actually ubiquitous. It's like the air. everything that you're doing right now is big data. So right now, uh, you could actually analyze uh, what I'm doing, uh, my hand movements, my tonality. Um, I mean, one of the big things I had actually put in and I took out was this whole thing about oral histories. I mean, my God, maybe we can actually do something else uh, on that. I mean, the amount of stuff that we can do to oral histories uh, is just phenomenal because the level of analysis you can bring in to voice, combine it with visual uh, things. I mean, uh, one of the things I really want to do because I look at the Himalayas and a lot of it is Buddhist, I want to actually uh, build a database, for example, of uh, Buddhist iconography over a millennia and a half across what is called uh, South Asia or the Indian subcontinent and try and see what are the linkages, what do certain visual elements, how do they express somewhere else? What is happening? Does that correlate to traveling of people, commodities, ideas, et cetera, et cetera? Um, the possibilities, challenges and possibilities, see challenges for, I mean, at least speaking for myself, is to think, understand what these computational tools are and to then think how they can be useful for social science research. Right. Um, and the final question is, what are the limitations and possibilities of studying gaze? Um, studying gaze and doing visual ethnography like studying festivals and, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's no limitations and poss I mean, there are of course limitations and possibilities, but yeah, you can, you know, you can study festivals, you can study politics, you can, uh, depends on what you want to study, right? Um, like, uh, I mean, um, if you have a festival, for example, or if you have an election, so you could, for example, analyze newspaper reports, tweets, Facebook posts, um, if ever we get access to WhatsApp chats, or if you are given access to a, a few groups to WhatsApp chats, all of that with electoral results, right? Uh, you can do all of those, uh, link it with uh, audio data, link it with visual data. The things that can be done are uh, quite significant. I mean, there's no, there's no sort of uh, hold all answer to that. Kannan. Uh, 
Kanan uh, has sent a direct message, I think. So I don't think others can see it. Uh, Prachi, I'll just read it out. Actually, he's, he's posted it for to everyone as well. But okay. Um, okay. Oh, right, right. At the bottom. Yeah. My question is, how does won't the ML-based censorship curation in media affect the studies just said it affects thinking? Of course it does. Of course it does. Everything we don't get, right? Uh, a lot of things are behind firewalls. Um, I mean, I was just joking a few weeks back with another friend about uh, China is going to be a big black box, right? Um, um, because we really don't know how to get in. And Kannan here has... So, for example, what Kannan is doing is that he's using, I mean, he's doing something which is so blindingly obvious. So what he's done is he's, and these are easily available tools, um, that is not to take away from the brilliance of what Kannan has done. Uh, and I'm saying this because I know him personally, he's got uh, basically a Mandarin to English translation software, which is easy. It's like picking it off the shelf in a supermarket. You can just get it, right? Uh, you might need to, work on it if you're if you're good at uh, programming if you're good at uh, you know uh, doing computer science as a computer scientist you can sort of make it better for yourself but he's basically got a mandarin to english translator and he uses that to through keywords certain keywords he uses that to look at what the chinese media is publishing on india or other things certain other things on Tibet, on trade, or US, sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. So it just picks up everything that is being posted online, publicly available. It is not behind a black box. And it translates Mandarin into English, and it provides it to us. Now, this is so blindingly obvious a thing we can do. right? And imagine, it should not take too much of time to build something where we can actually build something where anything written in any language which is available digitally anywhere in the world on any topic so um, uh, we can actually get that right on India for example so what is happening in India on a certain thing uh, somebody mentioned studying festivals or somebody mentioned studying um, uh, uh, political communication, right? Uh, you can give those keywords and say any language, translate it into English and do that. Uh, study it and then use uh, traditional tools, as Prachi calls them, and uh, digital tools to study what is happening. But uh, to Kannan's question about uh, ML-based censorship. So the Chinese do that. And not just the Chinese, so many other people do that for all. You know, India, we'll also start doing that uh, if we are not already doing that uh, secretly, uh, is that certain words won't show up, certain things don't show up. It already happens on Facebook, only certain posts show up, right? Now, whether it's curation or censorship, it's your choice. It's the same thing, basically. You're not showing everything, right? Certain people's posts come up, certain people's posts don't come up. And that's now started happening on Twitter, it happens everywhere else. So on these public platforms, Facebook is much more restrictive, but on Twitter and other places, you can actually go and pick up, and they give you APIs to pick up all these tweets, analyze them. So we, for example, uh, one of my colleagues, Radhika Krishnan, is doing this really brilliant project where she's getting everything online that is available on the farmers' protests and building an archive of that. So text, audio, video, um, um, uh, pictures, tweets, uh, newspaper articles, government orders, government press releases, everything, right? Uh, tagging them, good, solid metadata, all of that. But how do we get across that? I think the only way to get across that is that when... Um, People start engaging with this, talking about this, uh, taking it seriously. And I think it's important for social scientists, for journalists, for uh, regular citizens to get uh, involved with computer science tools that are available. How it affects human thinking? Gosh, Kanan, I have no clue. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, yeah, it does. But uh, ideas have a tendency to come through, you know, might 
be a generation or two or three, but uh, uh, the index of the Catholic Church is of sort of is an obsolete object by now. Um, are there yeah. other questions? Um, other questions? Um, somebody called SR wanted to ask a, a, a question. Um, you can type the question in there. Um, Students in this in this class, if you have uh, questions, you can type them into the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Uh, we can take maybe one or two more questions. Sure, sure. Okay. Anikit, if there are questions later on, which I'm sure will come up in our conversations. May I email them uh, to you, uh, yeah. you know, because we'll continue this, this conversation in future, uh, the rest of the classes also. Um, but um, if there are no uh, further questions, then um, I will draw the meeting to a close. Uh, by thanking uh, Dr. Aniket Alam profusely uh, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture and just opening up so many possibilities uh, for us to think about our existing questions, but also how to pose fresh questions through the, the new technological tools that are, are uh, becoming available uh, to us. And uh, I know that my mind is quite, quite buzzed. And, and, and so I'm very happy. Thank you very much, uh, Aniket. Uh, and thank uh, you for having me. So it was it was it was great and and I hope that we will be able to do uh, more talks uh, like this and perhaps you know other kind of collaborations we were talking about uh, into workshops and more detailed kind of engagements uh, as well. So this has been great. Thank you, thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.